Hey everybody, it's Chris, and today I'm interviewing Clint Ober. Clint is the founder of Earthing.com. He wrote a book called Earthing, which I have had for years, read it years ago. And I'm excited to interview Clint because um, earthing and grounding is, is a really powerful therapy that you can do for yourself that costs you nothing. And uh, there are so many health benefits, scientifically validated, evidence-based health benefits to just reconnecting with the earth, to grounding yourself to the earth. And uh, in our modern world, our modern advanced society, we have lost touch with the earth. And so um, I appreciate Clint and the work that he's done. He certainly educated me many years ago. Some of you, if you've read my books, you've heard me talk about this. So uh, yeah, it's a real pleasure, Clint, to connect with you uh, finally and, uh, and talk to you. Same here. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show. Yeah. So I'd love to hear your backstory. I mean, how did you, how did you get interested in this, uh, in the, the science of earthing and grounding and all that? Hey, um, that's, that's a, take a little bit to explain that, but anyhow, I, I grew up in uh, Montana and, uh, uh, in a kind of a agricultural rural environment and, and we ran cattle and anyhow, in that environment, um, uh, you know, this is back in the 40s and early 50s. Uh, in that environment, you know, everything is about, um, you know, everything was about prevention. You know, health was, um, for instance, like, you know, when I was a young, I sat on a horse and rode around the pasture and, and looking at cattle all day just to make sure that they were healthy and happy, you know, or what I, what I call happy. And if if uh, if one wasn't acting like the rest of the herd, then you take them out of the herd, put them in a holding pen, then you go ride the pasture and find out. Well, you know, it, uh, is the weed are there weeds coming up in the pasture? Is the grass too short? Is the water okay? Is the you know you just but you're looking for something in the environment, something in the pasture that contributed to the. Uh, problems that the calf was having or cow was having. And there's always something. It's usually the grass is too short, uh, or the water's you know going stale and so on. But anyhow, um, so I, I always I always had this bent of prevention. If one of the kids was sick, or if something's going on with anybody, they say, well, what caused that? But it comes from you know being in that environment when I grew up. So I always had this inquisitive uh, uh, nature of saying, okay, well, what's what's you know what's eating you? What's causing this? What what's going on here? And um, so, um, you know, that's the foundation I have. And but when I was about all oh, my early early twenties, I discovered the cable television industry. It was just beginning to uh, develop in Montana and Pennsylvania and so on. And I, I kind of I fell in love with the concept because, you know, here I was living in a town like Billings, Montana, and, you know, we had a couple of local TV stations. One was right, one was left, and they were always bickering. And and then you had a newspaper um, that was owned by, um, you know, one of the mining companies and so on. So it was kind of a very artificial environment for, uh, compared to the rest of the world. But most of it didn't. You know, when you when you live in these small communities, you don't realize the rest of the world back then. Today, this is you know when television came on scene, the only thing we had was radio and occasionally telephone. And um, so, but as as we started developing the cable industry, I could see that you know we could bring in a TV signal from Casper, Wyoming, or from Denver, Colorado, and then eventually from. Um, you know, Atlanta, New York, wherever. And all of a sudden the world changed for everybody because now we could see that we're a part of something much bigger, much greater than, than we were living day to day uh, in the hinterlands. And um, so anyhow, I, I was just totally in love with that concept and, and I got into it early. And in the early days when we were stringing cable, you know, we would just run wires to the house and have an antenna up on the hilltop and run it down the mountainside and, and then have, um, you know, connect the TVs to it or whatever. And uh, in the early days, we, you know, we learned about lightning. And uh, if there's an antenna or an aerial in the, in the uh, open environment and lightning strikes, well, it can get hit and take, take the um, charge to ground. 
And, and on the way, if it's going to a TV set or something, it can go into the home, blow up a TV set, create a fire. And so, so we learned that everything, um, and, and it's the same with telephone and, um, uh, you know, anything going into the home, any wire going into the home has to be grounded prior to going into the home so that if there is um, lightning in the air, static electricity being created because of the wind, um, just all the electrical phenomena that goes on around us, uh, there's charge everywhere. And so you have to ground it out um, before the cable goes into the house. And, and, and that way you get the nice, clean, clear pictures and, and cable is safe. So anyhow, I have about 30 year background, I, maybe a little longer of, um, you know, of grounding communication systems, whether it's satellite systems or head ends for cable television or low power television or television. But everything has to be grounded in order to keep the noise down and so that you can have good, clean sound, good, clean data, good, clean pictures. <laughs> and it's a real art. It's not something that most people in the world ever think about. And um, and the only people that really are familiar with it are people in communications or the sensitive electronics. Um, and, and so anyhow, I have a, a 30 year background in, in grounding uh, communication systems. And so I, it's second nature to me. I, I, everything, I see everything from an electrical point of view because everything in our environment is electrical. Every time you take a step in a house, if you are walking on a carpet or a dissimilar, you know, a shoe with a dissimilar fabric, then you're creating static charges on your body every step you take. You don't feel it unless it's over, you know, probably three or 4,000 volts. And then if you touch a doorknob, you'll see that spark and sometimes you'll feel it. But everything in our environment is electrical or charged. When I was a kid in elementary school, we used to deliberately shuffle our, our tennis shoes on the carpet and then shock each other. Exactly. <laughs> so. and, and, see, yeah. and the interesting thing about that in nature, that does not occur. If you're standing barefoot on here, you can't create a charge on the body. Yeah, that's a good point. And um, so, so the backstory. I mean, to continue on, uh, I, I spent about thirty years in the communications industry, and and, um, and when I was about fifty, I uh, developed a, 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 a compromised situation with my liver from an abscess that I ended up from a dental infection and a tooth and all things. And um, anyhow, so I kind of retired from the communications industry. And um, and it was a beautiful, fun industry because you you got to create everything from you know networks to uh, you know just educational networks. Everything you know it just goes on and on. But anyhow, um, <clears throat> the computer came along in uh, the '80s, early '80s, a little bit before Commodore 64 and all that. So in, in with those products, you even had to have better ground because. You, anything could glitch data, you know, a glitch could create a little static charge. And if you touch a computer, it'll glitch up and you have to shut it down, bring it back up and so on. Because back then nothing was grounded. Computers weren't grounded at anything. And um, so anyhow, I, um, uh, yeah, there's a whole story there. I was one of the first people to put uh, I went around the world and collected all the data services in the world, all the newswire services, uh, everything from UPI, AP, TAS from you know Russia, Xinhua, China, all of them. Put them in a unified data stream, put them up on satellite, bounced them down, and then if you had a Commodore 64, <laughs> uh, most people don't know what that is, but um, or I do. Uh, Okay, uh, or uh, you know, early apples or early early computer of any kind. I, I forget the names of some of them because they were they just didn't last. <clears throat> but anyhow, if you so then we created software that you could put in these computers, and then and then we had to create a DMOD or a, a modem uh, so that you could convert you know to data back to data. And um, 
and, and then you could put keywords in your on your software, and then you could read the data stream. So if you owned IBM stock, whenever IBM came by the data stream, then it would capture it so you could have a current quote. Or if you were following a certain sports team or even in Russia or wherever, it didn't matter. So this read everything that every wire service reporter put on the wire. And then, so you were the editor. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a fun, because I thought back then that data, I knew newspapers were going to die. But I, I thought data would be broadcast and I thought that it would be ad supported or be free like it was throughout all time. And then um, then it ended up being a subscription basis and everything for the Internet type things. And now we're going back to buying data or you know, it, it ad support and all that kind of. So the wheel turns. So anyhow, I spent a lot of time, you know, the grounding. But then after that, I when I. Uh, went through this health issue where I had, um, they, they, had re, they had to go in and replace or remove a large part of my liver and they, wasn't, they weren't sure that I would even make it. But anyhow, um, I did, surprisingly. <laughs> There's a whole story that goes with it. But, but the concept uh, or the, um, the main thing is I, I did survive. They cut out about five-sixths of my liver on the main lobe which didn't leave much resources left. It took me a long time, you know, probably a month to even walk, you know, walk across the room hardly by myself. And it took me about a, six months to be able to walk a mile because I had to walk a few, a few more steps every day. But within six months, my liver grew back 100% in size. That's and amazing. I'm, and they took over 80% of your liver. That's wild. Yeah, that's wild. And uh, so it was marginal. And, uh, and and what was interesting about it, I was 50 years old, and I was, we lived in a, in a 5,000 square foot A-frame home, two bedroom home in Evergreen, Colorado, that I could see all the way to Vail. And so you know, you, you know, when you're young, you're about 50. That's when you're you're playing king of the mountain, you know, with all the other guys. And and I had won, you know, I'd made money and I had fun and all that kind of stuff. But then you then you go to the doc because you have a uh, you know, issue going on, and then all of a sudden you find out you're near death. And so it, it's really a sobering experience. Anyhow, when I um, went through that experience, I didn't know much about, I didn't know anything about grounding the human body at that time. It didn't even occur to me. But through that process uh, of recovering, you know, I woke up one morning and, and, uh, and I noticed everything in my environment was more vibrant, more colorful, more electrical. And um, I didn't know, but I had this kind of, I, I looked around my bedroom and I had all this beautiful art and all these things that I had collected forever. And but anyhow, I realized that I almost died and that if I had died, all this stuff, where would it, what would have happened? Because I spent my whole life collecting nice art. And, and the only person that knew its real value was me because I was the one who placed the value on it, bought it um, and created a home for it. And then forever took care of it. So my life was about taking care of all of my possessions. And so I had this little epiphany where I, I just had to get rid of everything I owned because my life was about taking care of those things. And, and I wanted to experience something greater in life, something whatever. I didn't know at that time, but I was just happy to be alive. <laughs> well, it sounds like the old adage that uh, what you own ends up owning you. Yes. It is. Yes. It is. And, the, and the other one is the more you have the more you have to worry about. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. So I wanted my freedom back. And I wanted to be like that young boy out in the pasture. <laughs> just no responsibility other than just take babysitting some cows or something. But anyhow, um, I ended up selling my home, everything. I gave everything away except for, I, I think I took two and a half suitcases of clothing, bought a small RV, and I spent four years traveling around the United States living in national parks. I loved it. <laughs> a lot of fun, a lot of great people out there. Anyhow, um, so then all of a sudden I realized I had to, I mean, I was getting bored with that, so I needed to go back and do something. But I didn't want to make my life about money. I wanted to make my life about doing something that I felt good about inside. Because if I would have died at that time, I was not very happy with myself. But I wanted to make my life about, I wanted to be able, the next time I die, to be able to feel like, you know, I was worth being here, you know, that, It'll, you know, something other than just chasing the buck. And um, <clears throat> so anyhow, I spent those four years running around. And then one night I was down in Key Largo, Florida, on the Bay side, 
and watching the sunset. It's always beautiful down there. Some manatees are out there. I was beating in a little bit of water. And, um, and I had this feeling come over me that I needed to go back west and, and go to work and do something. So I packed everything up and, and left. And, but, um, but I had this very earthy feeling. I didn't understand it. Uh, so I went back west to LA area and then I didn't want to stay there. So I went to Phoenix, Tucson. That wasn't feeling good. So I decided I would go up to Flagstaff because that's more like Montana where I'm from snow and cold and pine trees. And on the way up, I, 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 uh, it was getting late and I saw a little RV sign. So I pulled in, uh, to a town, a little town called Sedona, Arizona. And it was full of, uh, and, and it was dark. So I just, you know, you wait and pay in the morning and at, at the RV park. And so I parked, went to sleep, woke up in the morning, looked outdoors. And I said, I'm not leaving here. This is like living in a national park. Because you have the, the red rocks and and then it's full of art galleries and I love art so I was just like wow this is this is pretty neat so I spent about two years there and in the process um, I got involved with some of the local art galleries helping them to light their art and present their art better and so on and I didn't have any money to pay you <laughs> it was just something fun to do and <clears throat> so anyhow one day I was uh, ordering some parts for a, a lighting a light show. At one of the nice galleries there, and and um, and my computer kept glitching; it kept going down, and it was just frustrating. So I realized it was static electricity. So I ran a piece of tape, metal tape, copper tape, across my desk and connected it to a ground. So every time I would touch my computer, before I would touch it, I put my fingers on the tape, ground the static electricity on my body, then I could go and 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 put my orders in and do whatever everything was fine and after that i went outdoors and um anybody familiar with the area uh, and this is across from talakapaki a little tourist area and so anyhow i went, went, went out and sat on a bench and up pulls a big tour bus and in this tour bus was a group of uh, japanese tourists and because they were short in stature, a little shorter in stature, but they were all kind of a, you could tell they were a tour group. And I, I noticed that their shoes, they all had white Nike type tennis shoes on. And intuitively I asked, I said, I wonder if there's a consequence of, you know, humans wearing these rubber sole shoes because, you know, when I was a kid, we were always barefoot or we wore a leather shoe and if you had leather shoe you had to live for school or church or whatever but you didn't wear shoes hardly at all you know at during the summer or at home and um so barefoot or leather and then it was about 1960 when they we invented plastics polymers the first thing we did and that's only 65 years ago <laughs> Uh, and I've been working on this project for 25 years ago. So at the time I asked the question, it was 40 years into shoes. And, and I didn't know. I had no idea. But I, because I had the static and the computer event, so I went home that night. I grabbed a, a voltmeter and I grounded it to the earth and put a long wire on and started walking around my house and measuring the difference in uh, the charge was on my body compared to when I'm standing barefoot on the earth, I'm equal with the earth. There's no charge. But when I put shoes on immediately, then I, my body becomes an antenna and I attract all of this static and all of this electrical noise that's in, in our living environments. And it's, it's, you live in a sea of electrical noise. We all do. And I'm not saying it's harmful. I don't think for the most part it, it is by itself. What's harmful, I've learned, is being not grounded, not being grounded. That night, I, or I, I took a, a roll of three inch wide metal duct tape like you would use on furnaces. And I laid it across my bed and I connected it to a ground rod, threw it out the window. And then I connected another one to a meter, threw it out the window. And then I would lay on the duct tape and all the noise would disappear. My body voltage, the voltage is in static and 
anything, you know, my body would, would drop to zero. So I knew I was grounded. I knew I was at Earth potential. The thing that's interesting about that, I was at that time maybe 54. And um, uh, I had a lot hard time sleeping because I had skied for 30 years. I had blown out everything you can play tennis. I, and I was a cowboy. <laughs> and anything that you could do, you could rough yourself up. You know, I, that's my life. Um, but, but anyhow, so I had a lot of pain and a lot of issues and it was very challenging for me to sleep. And I usually, um, left, left the TV on late at night so I could entertain myself while I was falling asleep. So, but anyhow, I was playing with the meter and then all of a sudden it was the next morning and I thought, wow, there's something going on here because I don't sleep. And so I played with it a little bit and slept grounded for a couple of three days. And then I thought, wow, this is interesting. So, and it works. So I said, I don't, I'm surprised nobody told me about this because I've been taking pain pills and stuff forever. And so I ran into a couple of friends of mine and I told them about it. And I said, you guys got to try this. And because nobody sleeps, hardly anybody sleeps, especially when you get older. And uh, so I grounded both of them. One of the wives got pretty upset because I messed up a sheet. <laughs> Or we, we messed up a sheet, whatever. But anyhow, both of them uh, had a similar experience. But one of them come over and he said, he said, do you think this could have anything to do with my arthritis? He said, because my arthritis pain has dropped significantly. And I said, oh, no, I don't think so. I think it's about just sleep. And then all of a sudden I realized my pain, my chronic pain had diminished significantly. And I said, well, there's something really going on here. And so I went back then. All we had was AOL and, uh, you know, getting on the Internet was there's not much there. So I, I looked there and found nothing uh, on static or health or anything. And then I went to Nexus Lexus, started, you know, downloading data and and couldn't really find anything other than. I think it was in the 1950s, they realized that when they were doing open heart surgery, uh, that a lot of people were dying and they didn't know why. And it was because of static charges because they didn't think about static electricity back then. Uh, we didn't have a lot of plastics and stuff. Um, so anyhow, but they have to ground patients to before they can open up the chest because you don't want static electricity leaking in and creating a, uh, a cardio event. So, but that was about that. Other than that, it was just some folklore. And uh, and I thought, well, this is, you know, and so I kept testing it and the results were always the same. And I said, this is very real. People have got to know about this. So I said, I'm going to go out to L.A. So I went out to UCLA and I went and found my way into one of the sleep labs. And, and I said, you know, we need to do a study. And this is what I've discovered. And they looked at me and there's about four of them, I think, sitting around the table. They looked at me and they said, do you expect us to believe that somebody's going to put a nail in the ground, tie a wire around somebody's toe, and they're going to sleep better? And I said, well, yes. And they said, no. He said, you're nuts. Get out of here. You're crazy. Go away. But anyhow, we joked around a little bit after that. And then I began to realize they didn't really understand electrical phenomena uh, because it's invisible. Nobody thinks about it. And I certainly knew nothing about biology then, but that was 30 years ago. So today I'm dangerous. <laughs> um, so, so now that's kind of um, how it all got started. But uh, in order to do a study, I had to get a couple of the kids from UCLA to help me design the study. And I had to go do it myself because they wanted more evidence, you know, that what was going on. And, um, so I ended up doing a study of 60 people, 30 of them grounded, 30 of them ungrounded, and we found significant results. Mainly, uh, everybody went to sleep, everybody slept better, everybody had less pain, but 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 they also reported things like TMJ went away, um, PM, PMS issues disappeared, all kinds of these. Uh, it's like one of the ladies said to me, said, well, it can't be a cure-all. And I said, well, being ungrounded may be a cause-all. <laughs> so I don't know about the cure-all. And um, so anyhow, that's kind of how it got started. And then since that time, uh, we've done 30-plus peer-reviewed published studies. We have hundreds of articles now, uh, review articles, everything you can think of. 
And, and everything combined uh, suggests one thing. You can't have charge in a grounded object. Can't have charge in a grounded computer. Can't have charge in a grounded amplifier. Can't have charge in a grounded animal or a grounded human. It just can't happen. It, 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 that's what grounding is all about. And so uh, the story to go through all those studies is quite lengthy. Um, but but the real bottom line of what we discovered, and it took um, it took about eight years before we really fully understood the mechanism of action, um, because all I knew was we would ground the body and pain would go away and you would sleep better. And um, but we didn't know what was going on in the body to make that to, you know, to have that effect. And nobody wanted to listen to it. Nobody wanted to hear a story. They wanted to hear, you know, mechanism of action. So <clears throat> one day, or about 204, I think it was, Ritger and the boys at, back at Boston, Mass., came out with a, a uh, research paper. And then it was published in Time magazine. Uh, and it showed the body on fire. And they had the word inflammation. And subtitled, you don't have cancer, you don't have this, you don't have that, you don't have all these health disorders. What you have is chronic inflammation, and it manifests differently in different people based on your lifestyle and your living environment. And <clears throat> as soon as I understood that, then I started researching inflammation, or not inflammation, because inflammation wasn't really a term yet in, the, in, in modern language. And so I started uh, doing research on the immune system and oxidation. And and then uh, one day I came across an article talking about a neutrophil, the simple white blood cell neutrophil. What happens is you have a, if you have a uh, pathogen or a damaged cell in the body that needs to be re re removed, the immune system or a neutrophil, the immune system will send a neutrophil over and it will encapsulate it's a kind of a jelly cell it'll kind of wrap itself around a pathogen and, and or a damaged cell or whatever and then it will release reactive oxygen species well the word reactive means it's electrically charged it's so powerful that it can rip an electron from a pathogen that's a that's a high voltage event and um, so as soon as i read that i said well, it's uh, so what we're doing here is we're re these when so when the immune system responds, if you do not neutralize any excess radicals that are left over after a normal oxidative burst or inflammatory bur burst, then <clears throat> then these elect these neutrophils, I mean, these reactive oxygen species, they're only going to last three or four nanoseconds. And then they're going because they're electrically charged. And they're in there. They're looking for an electron they could steal so they can neutralize themselves. So they will steal an electron from anything in the immediate area. And most often that is just adjacent tissue. And so let me interject here. I, I'm completely with you. And just so folks understand, reactive oxygen species are also known as free radicals. Yes. And they cause damage to your body. They cause, cause damage to tissue. And, uh, the goal of nutrition, of grounding, uh, healthy living is mm -hmm. to neutralize free radicals uh, so they don't cause chronic inflammation and damage, right? Right. So that's where, that's where we were at that time. So <clears throat> cowboy logic out in the pasture. <laughs> okay, well, how does grounding reduce, you know, this inflammation? Um, and because our question was, what the aha was, if all of these modern health disorders are related to this inflammation, and you, the only way you know you have inflammation is you, if you have pain in your body. You can't have pain without inflammation because it's a byproduct. It's a message to the body, get me out of here, I'm on fire. So, but, but anyhow, so... Let me just say, sometimes you can have inflammation and not know it, though, and not well, have the pain yet. Yeah. Yeah, it's subtle, low-grade inflammation, and that's really the inflammation we're talking about here. It has to go on for years and years until it manifests into something significant. 
Um, but, but anyhow, so, so anyhow, then it just cowboy logic told me, he says, okay, if I'm adding electrons to the body, which we knew we were, then the electrons are neutralizing these remaining radicals. Because as soon as we ground a person, any pain they have will automatically begin to resolve the damage that the oxidative stress created. It may take a time to heal, but the actual pro pro the oxidative process, you stop it. You stop the neutrophils, the chain reaction of, of uh, the neutrophils oxidizing. Uh, inflammation is a byproduct of chronic um, uh, the immune, you know, immune dysfunction, immune, uh, you know, autoimmune disorder, autoimmune disease. The immune system is doing exactly what it was designed to do, but it didn't know, or didn't know that the human lost its ground. So it, it lost its uh, source of free electrons to mop up and clean up and reduce these radicals uh, before they can damage tissue. Now, to kind of short circuit this, put it in perspective, you know, animals in the wild, cancer rarely exists, if ever, in, in the in wild population. You have to contaminate their environment. You have to do something to screw up their environment. They've been here for, you know, eons of time. And um, on the other hand, animals who live indoors with their owners, they manifest the same health disorders as their owners. Um, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, 50% of them die from cancer, similar to their owners, similar to the same percentage of, of owners. So what this suggests is, you know, something in the, you know, we changed our environment. We are no longer naturally grounded. Our bodies are on fire. This is a modern phenomenon. It's only 65 years old that we even, that we, that we really started disconnecting from the earth. We, we started moving indoors in the 50s. Television came along, and then we started carpeting the floors, and then we all put on leather sole or plastic sole shoes. And so over a period of just a few years, we disconnected from the earth. We lost our electrical ground. It would be like me going into the head end of a cable system and unplugging all the grounds, and then all of a sudden you're going to have noise and static and, and chaos and bad pictures and lots of service calls. <laughs> and, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, okay, I've got, I've got so many questions. I can't wait to ask you. Oh, go for um, it. All right. The first one is, and just so we explain for viewers, what is happening now, you know, what exactly happens when you step onto the earth barefoot? There's an electron exchange. What, what's going on there? Okay. As soon as you, first of all, know that the earth has maintains a negative charge, the word negative meaning no charge and an excess of free electrons that can quickly at speed of light, in some cases, travel and reduce charge, uh, like lightning, for instance, boom. Um, <clears throat> so the earth is electrical. Uh, it maintains a, a natural electrical charge, and this charge can absorb, uh, well, okay, so, so the earth can give up electrons freely, or it can absorb electrons, because the earth is infinitely large, especially compared to a human body. Human body is infinitely small. so. When you stand barefoot on the earth, if your body is short of electrons, it will absorb instantly and start begin absorbing electrons from the earth until it reaches a point where the earth and the body have the same uh, electrical potential, meaning no, no charge difference. And um, <clears throat> as long as you are barefoot on the earth, you can't have charge in your body. It's not possible. You'll still have oxidation. You'll still have uh, oxidative bursts, all those kind of things. That's natural. That's normal. But you won't have the collateral damage because the free electrons from the earth ground or mop up all of those excess radicals and prevent the immune system from going astray. So before, uh, you know, as we've developed as a society and a culture and, and all that, um, our ancestors, of course, slept on the ground, Yep. right? They would walk barefoot or maybe wear leather sandals, right? Mm -hmm. Leather shoes. Mm -hmm. So leather, they, they can ground through the leather, right? Yes. Yeah. Leather. Even, is, yes. Even primitive houses. Well, not, not necessarily primitive, but let's say conventionally framed houses where you have wood 
piers going into the earth and then you have a wood subfloor and hardwood flooring would you be grounded in a house like that generally no okay so the wood acts you know, yeah. wood is acting as a buffer yes it is okay so as soon as we started building houses off the ground yeah, as soon as we started elevating homes it was primarily the europeans you know the early europeans um you know, it's like Native Americans, they all slept on the earth, you know, men, uh, in China today, even the, the, most of the people sleep within two inches of the earth. Um, and uh, what about concrete? Do, do, do electrons flow through concrete? Yeah, con concrete generally, it's earth. If it's laying on the earth, it's, it's made of earth and material and, and it holds moisture. So, yes, it will be electrically conductive. It won't be. I mean, it'll have some resistance, but it is like standing barefoot on the earth. That's interesting. OK, we know that stone is, of course. Yes. So if you were barefoot uh, in the mountains, right, on yes. stone. As long as, as long as it's all connected to the earth, you're, yeah. you're grounded. You're in the grass. You're at the beach. Right. Yeah. You're in the water. There's this there's a free flow of electrons between your body and the earth. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you got shoes on, right, especially rubber, rubber soled shoes, which is most shoes. Yeah. Uh, or if you're indoors in a, in a house, most houses, buildings. It, it, can you even think of an example of a building where you could walk around barefoot and be grounded? Yeah. Uh, any building that has a concrete floor. If it's a concrete foundation and a concrete floor. Yes, because there's rebar tying all the concrete together. And then, uh, you know, it's, it, it's just anything connected to the earth is going to equalize with the earth. Well, there's people watching this that, that may have a stained concrete floor, which was, you know, a trend for a while. And they're probably really excited right now because <laughs> they didn't realize how beneficial it was. Of course, most people wear their shoes in the house. We actually don't. Um, but uh, you'll have to start taking your shoes off in your house. That's step one. If you mm -hmm. have a stained concrete floor, uh, unfortunately, we have a concrete slab, but then we have wood on top of it. So I guess, you know, we, we really have to go outside yeah. to ground. Yes. I'll tell you something that I've noticed. I had some inflammation. I'm a chronic exerciser and uh, I had some inflammation, both my elbows, the tendons flared up. They call it golfer's elbow, but I don't play golf. Right. Um, but I've noticed since the weather has warmed up, uh, mm -hmm. I've been outside a lot more walking around in the grass. Right. I've been grounding. Yes. Uh, and I wasn't doing that in the winter, right? Just, just a few weeks ago, you know, over the last few months, I haven't really grounded at all, right. uh, during the day outside barefoot. And I've noticed my, my, uh, inflammation has improved dramatically. In fact, I don't have any right now. And I'm, and just from our conversation, I'm like, oh yeah, like, and, and also one other factor, I have a grounding sheet on my bed uh -huh. uh, and, and bought it years ago from, from earthing.com. Uh -huh. And, uh, but we've moved and in the course of the move, the sheet got lost and I haven't replaced it. So I haven't been grounded at night either. Uh, and I'll mention, I, I have a grounding pad here that my, can you, can everybody see that? Yes. Yeah, this is the grounding pad that my keyboard sits on that my hands are in contact with when I'm working at my computer. See, it's got this, well, I don't have enough. I can't show you the, the cord where it's plugged in because it's not long enough. But anyway, so yeah, grounding has been, a, a, I've been a, sort of obsessed with it for a long time. And uh, in the winter months, I realized, yeah, I, this the past winter, I didn't have a grounding sheet on my bed. I haven't grounded outside much at all. And uh, yeah, maybe that's, it makes a lot of sense why I've had some inflammation issues. Yeah. Anybody who is not grounded 24 seven, um, anytime your body is not grounded, your body is forever, your immune system is forever functioning. I mean, it's constantly defending against pathogens and viruses and you name it. So it's, it's active 24 seven, every breath of air you breathe, your immune system has to deal with all of that. So anytime you are not grounded, then you are vulnerable to inflammation manifesting. That inflammation may start out very, very slow, but if you, but if you go chronically ungrounded, then all of a sudden the aches and pains start to increase and then anxiety, irritability, uh, and then it goes into a host of uh, autoimmune related health disorders 
and uh, it's just the immune system. It's it's you know it's 1960 about. 90% of the visits to a practitioner were for an infectious disease, acute injury, and childbirth. Today, 99% of all health disorders are, are inflammation-related. Cardiovascular disease, lupus, MS, autism, all of these are inflammation now. I mean, and we've only learned this in the last few years, uh, you know, like autism. John Hopkins came out and said and it's inflammation-related. Um, cancer, of course, inflammatory. Yeah, yeah, well, cancer, of course, yes, yeah, absolutely. I mean, cancer is a, um, you know, I mean, I could go on. I work with a lot of people all the time, and uh, the main thing to do is you have to ground the body and and stop the inflammation first. The number one thing you have to do is reduce the inflammation, and the only way you can do that is you have to have a blueberry drip. <laughs> And I'm not sure that would do it. Or stand barefoot on the earth. If barefoot on the earth, then you can, in just 30 minutes, it's going to change your how you feel, how you look. Your energy is going to come up. Your pain is going to come down. And the immune system can then go to work, clean up the damage you created, and then eventually go back to maintaining health and restoring health. And that's the thing I try to get across to is health is the most natural state. You see it in nature everywhere you go. Uh, if you don't have health, if you do not have health, then something in your environment is interfering with your immune system's ability to maintain health. Because the immune system only knows to do one thing, return the body to normal. And I could go on and show you pictures of people who had gnarled, crippled up arthritis, and five years later, they're pretty much back to normal. So the, the immune system knows what it's doing. The body knows what it's doing. It's got kind of, millions of years of knowledge that makes so much sense and uh it really is amazing and i think a lot of folks have a hard time wrapping their brain around it much like the researchers that you first talked to where they say oh that's just too simple it can't be it right that yeah. can't be it right that right. something so simple and so easy to do how could that possibly be helpful or be the cause or the lack of be the cause of so many problems and in uh, in human health but the good news about grounding is like i said earlier it's free it costs you nothing you just have to make the time to get in contact with the earth now you could invest in some things that help you ground like a grounding sheet for your bed which i think is a terrific thing to do obviously because i've bought one and use it and and like a grounding pad this is this mat that i use you can put it under your feet while you work or you can put it under your keyboard um so there's there's things you can you can invest in for a very little amount of money to help stay grounded throughout the day because we can't all hang out outside barefoot, you know, and all, all our waking hours of the day. Right. <laughs> oh, unfortunately. I'd like to ask you about some of the studies. I know there's been a ton of them, but, uh, some of the most memorable studies that you've done or are aware of, I'd love to hear you talk about just some of the results of those studies in, in terms of grounding with humans, what, what was measurable changes that were measurable in humans in a certain amount of time, like 10 minutes of grounding or 30 minutes of grounding? Like what did they, what did they find happen in their body? Well, people can mostly relate to pain, you know? So it's like, I started out um, trying to find subjects in the um, late nineties, early 2000. And the only people I could get to give me subjects were rheumatologists and they were primarily, uh, you know, the MS, the lupus ladies and so on, because there's not much they could do to help them back then. I don't know if there is today either, but but anyhow, so they said, you know, you take them, <laughs> we can't help them. You know, and so I, they would give them to me and I would be able to ground them. And so the number one thing that I learned, the first thing I learned was with MS is um, I could ground a woman with MS and within 15 to 30 minutes, I mean, her color would change. Uh, her, she would have more control over her, her, her muscles, and, uh, but her respiration would, um, just everything changed. She looked 10 years younger, just within 15 to 30 minutes. And so what happened was you had improved circulation. But the number one thing I learned from them is I could take an electrode patch, an EKG patch, and just stick it in the palm of the hand on the side where she may have had more issues than not, and then just connect it to an electrical ground. 
and then just sit there and just, you know, visit with her, explain, tell the story. And within usually five to 10 minutes, the hot burning pain stops. That's the oxidative pain. That's the ungrounded reactive oxygen. That process stops. Then there's damage that's been done. That pain is more subtle, but it doesn't have that burning in that hot um, acid type feel. So after years went on, I could tell most of all of the ladies with MS, I said, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes after grounding, you no longer have MS. You have damage from MS, and it may take a long time for that to heal up. In some cases, not as long. <clears throat> but as long as you stay grounded, you cannot have uh, the, the MS is the um, um, the reactive oxygen species are oxidizing the myelin sheath. And there's a chain reaction. There's no, not enough redox potential or free electrons to stop the process. So it just keeps on going and keeps on going. And it's a slow you know, process, but it happens over years and then it explodes. But so anyhow, but grounding these women, I could honestly say after a few years that, you know, you no longer have MS. What you have is just the damage. And if you stay grounded, that means, and I learned with them, you have to, they have to be grounded 16 to 18 hours a day in order to keep that under control, depending on the damage. And they can get away with, you know, a few hours. But as soon as the pain comes back, you have to get grounded. But, but anyhow, so that's, that's one of the most profound things because those people are, are really struggling and really suffering. And, um, and so, but I, I, to give you the technical background on it, I have to go to the blood. The most important study that we did was the blood viscosity study. So we can take a person or a group of people, put them, uh, um, draw blood and take a look at uh, and measure the thickness of the blood. And there's a technical way to do that. And, and then we would ground them for, you know, 30 minutes or 40 minutes. And by putting electrode patches on the bottom of the feet and connecting them to the earth, trying to mimic standing barefoot on the earth. The number one thing that happens within almost instantly, your blood viscosity uh, decreases, meaning the blood becomes very thin. And then how it does that is <clears throat> when you're not grounded, your blood is kind of thick and sticky. Everybody's is. The and cells clump together too, right? Yeah, clumps together. Rular formation or they're just stacked up like coins and so on. <clears throat> and then the blood is thick and sticky, can't get in and out of the capillaries properly, can't oxygenate the tissue. So, but as soon as you ground, then the red blood cells on the average will go from five millivolts negative to about 20 millivolts negative. So you increase the negative charge on red blood cells by 300%. That's huge. Now the, the, the blood is like red wine, you know, very thin and, and it can go in and out of the capillaries and oxygenate the tissue. You can see the person pink up. You can see the circulation. I tell the average lady that you're going to look, this is really a beauty product because you're going to look 10 years younger in about 30 minutes. And they all do because the color comes up, the pain comes down, demeanor changes, they smile, they're happy or happier. Um, but, but anyhow, um, so the fact that grounding alone normalizes blood viscosity, the thickness of the blood is remarkable. Now we took it to, it took us a long time to get it published. Nobody understood it. Nobody believed it, but we ended up getting it published. But, but the significance of it is it's. It's hard to measure. You can't go into a doctor's office and say, I want to measure my blood viscosity. It's not really practical to do. It's not affordable to do. And uh, so the only way you can tell is they have, you know, there's other ways they can tell people have thick blood. And that's why so many older people are on blood thinners. And um, imagine you can measure blood pressure, right? There should oh, yeah. be an improvement in blood pressure if the blood yeah. is thinner. No, we have a. Uh, 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 Dr. Alkin, who did a, a cardiologist who did a nice uh, little study on um, on blood pressure, and it's significant. Uh, you reduce the you know when the blood can 
you know, move, then you reduce the pressure. And um, yeah, but anyhow, so I hope I explained that properly, but just going and standing on the earth is going to normalize your blood viscosity, the thickness of your blood. And then the blood can get in and out of the capillaries. And blood cells can only go into the capillaries from one single file, one at a time. And if your blood is thick and sticky, that's what impedes that process. And that's why so many people look um, gaunt or they, their color is not good. Um, their energy is low, their, their fatigue, chronic fatigue, all these things. But <clears throat> so anyhow, the most important, that's why the most important thing to do. And I, what I try to encourage everybody to do is take 30 minutes out of your life go outdoors. Hopefully, you, you, hopefully if there's, there's a little bit of sunshine or indirect sunshine, because the other problem that's just as um, problematic as loss of grounding is loss of vitamin, uh, loss of sunshine. We live in roofs under roofs now. We no longer get our vitamin D. So everybody's supposed to go take vitamin D tabs. You know, and That's okay. And that, that's all good. But the point is, uh, we have screwed up our environment. <laughs> but anyhow, put your bare feet on the earth with sunshine above and and your body's a fuel cell i mean you're breathing oxygen you're the, you have negative charge from the earth you have positive charge. i mean it's it, it's much different than we think and so but you, people need to experience that they need to feel it and they need to notice the change that occurs and then if you if you really feels good if your health is really compromised then you need to spend more time and 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 grounded, oh, you know, barefoot on the earth or however you do it. And you, you have to stay grounded until the pain stops. Because if you have pain of any kind, you have a chronic inflammation. So in order until you stay on the earth long enough or stay grounded long enough, when the pain stops, then it's okay to get up and go ungrounded for a while. As soon as the pain comes back, your body's on fire. Get back and get grounded. Put the fire out. Put the, you know. So it's really that simple. Um, but anyhow, I could go on and on and on. You know, I have seen, I, I, I don't ever want to give false hope to anybody because if you're going to be dependent on grounding, then you have to put a serious, you know, you have to seriously uh, incorporate it into your lifestyle. But you also have to eat well and you have to think well and all of that. And because we're talking about cancer, um, I have some pretty... I have some experiences with cancer and a lot of people with cancer. And the thing that I've learned over the years, and I have to tell a little story. I hope we have time. Um, when I was a young boy sitting on, on that horse sometime uh, and riding the cattle, some years you had uh, tall grass and an infestation of jackrabbits. And these jackrabbits, are, they do nothing except they can sit there and eat grass all day. But the coyotes, they eat rabbits. So anytime you have an infestation of jackrabbits, you're going to have an infestation of coyotes. So out in the pasture, you have this game going all the time, you know, the jackrabbits and the coyotes. And so a jackrabbit's sitting there eating grass like nothing's going on. And then all of a sudden he gets a whiff of a coyote and the coyote uh, will spring or jump. The, the rabbit will spring up in the air about 10 feet. And then the rabbit will zigzag back and forth across the pasture and the coyote running doggedly behind, and eventually he will run out of energy and he'll just sit down and drop. The rabbit will run just a little bit further and, 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 and stop. Conservation of energy, they do not waste energy. And, and, and then as soon as the coyote either heads off a different direction, then the rabbit will sit there. But the rabbit, you can see he's shaken. I mean, because he's just had his, his, his body is charged with cortisol to the limit and, and and he's sitting there shaking and then when the coyote wanders off then the rabbit will have a big visceral shake like that then it'll go back to eating grass like nothing ever happened now humans and I, I usually talk to women on uh, podcasts or whatever and, and and i i try to tell them you know your lives are filled with I mean, you're full of coyote juice because what happened? You get up in the morning and you got the kids running around and you got to get them off to school and you got the husband or whatever. And you got all these things and everything is, you know, 
kind of cri mini crisis, a chronic mini crisis, getting everybody off out the door and whatever. And then when they're all gone, then you got to sit and take a moment and then recoup. Then you got to get yourself ready. And if you're working, then you have to go get in a car, drive to work. And all this time you're not grounded. And, and you get in the car, by the time you get in the car, you know, your body's full of cortisol. Every little thing that goes on is going to put a little bit, squirt a little bit of cortisol into your system. And, and, and then you get into a car and start driving, then all of a sudden road rage and, and, and all of these things. And, um, and then you go to work, you sit underneath fluorescent lights on carpet and whatever. So your body is completely charged. And so your, your body is just full of everything is uh, fight or flight. And so the body's full of cortisol. And so what I try to do is every try to leave them with one thing that no matter what you learn from this, no matter what you believe, you've got to, at the end of the day, go outdoors, take your shoes off, put your feet on the earth and ground out the coyote juice, just like the rabbit does. Because if you don't, that cortisol will eat your body up. You'll start out with anxiety, irritability, and oftentimes depression, uh, then to fibromyalgia, then to lupus, to AMS, to cancer, cardiovascular disease. They're all connected. They're all one disease. They're all related. And they show up differently in different people based on your mental, <laughs> uh, because something up here is driving a lot of that cortisol also. So it's, it's bigger than one thing. Grounding is just going to reduce the charge in your body and keep it level. <laughs> Yeah, to get you out of that uh, sympathetic dominant state and into yes. parasympathetic dominance, which is yeah. the rest state and not the stress state, right? Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Clint Ober, this has been amazing. I <laughs> just thank you so much for your time. I, I could talk to you all day. Unfortunately, I have another interview. We got back-to-back -back interviews today. Okay. I want to make sure people can find you and connect with you and learn more from you. As I've said, you wrote a book called Earthing, which is fantastic. People can find you at earthing.com. Any other links that we can share? Or Well, the Earthing movie on YouTube, it's free. It's an hour long. It's an award-winning documentary on grounding. Uh, the Earthing Institute uh, is where all of our research is, uh, and it's all free to the public. And, uh, yeah, you're, we're available out there. <laughs> Just look for us if you, look for, if you need us. And if you have any questions, be sure and send them in. We'll, uh, we always answer everything. That's fantastic. Thank you so much again. Thanks for watching, everybody. Please share this video. Help us reach more people. Grounding or earthing is free. It's incredibly powerful. Start doing it today. Please report back in the comments uh, how it's affected you. If you notice a difference in your pain or your inflammation or yeah. your stress, if you start spending time barefoot outdoors, yeah. uh, it's not hard. You know, you just got to make time for it. So yeah. do it and let us know how it helps you. Thanks for watching. I'll see you on the next one.